Hi, my name is Paul Horvath, and I'm a guest of the U.S. delegation. Um, I'd like to direct um, my comment uh, or question to the d distinguished foreign minister of India and maybe ask you to expand on your, I believe is your second point, which is that the West was so sure of its infinite supremacy that it failed to explore other avenues of engagement with other parts of the world. Um, I'd like to, I'm not so sure I agree with it, and indeed, I think one of the reasons, at least from the U.S. perspective, that we may be in the mess that we're in is there's many who believe that it was quite the opposite, that it was incredible amounts of engagement actually with India and China, China more on trade, India more on information technology that got us to where we were. So maybe you could expand on that and explain it because it's not something that I'm quite sure I understand. Sure. Uh, well, you know, I was looking over a longer time frame, uh, say post Second World War, not just the last uh, 10 or 20 years. Uh, and uh, the reason I said that was, today, if you look at a rules-based order, if you look at democratic practices, you look at pluralistic societies, I think uh, after 1945, one of the reasons why people thought that political democracy, market economy, pluralistic societies could be the universal norm, was because a poor developing country which had just got its independence chose those options. So by India choosing those options, it took it out of it being a solely Western characteristic and made it much broader. And over a period of time, a number of other countries in the global south in uh, Asia and Africa have, have uh, followed suit. Now, when it comes today to a lot of these practices, I think it's important that if the standards and conversations and interests are narrowly West, then the tendency is to say, well, you know, this is a Western problem. This is not a global problem. Uh, I mean, we've seen, you know, when, we, when I was analyzing why is it multilateralism is weaker, why has Westlessness happened? Part of it is that, uh, the, you know, uh, the resort to conveniences. I mean, I'll give you an example. You know, there was a period where we had a military dictatorship to the east of India and to the west of India at the same time. The one east of India got sanctioned in Myanmar. The one west of India ended up as a major non-NATO ally. So, you know, these, so what happens is, in many ways, uh, I would say the lot of the messages about values and beliefs and order and rules tended to be uh, vitiated by, uh, by the politics of the day. And I, I think what it did was, it, in a sense, there is a, today a constituency, I think, for the West, beyond the West. I mean, if you ask me in India, and I think uh, my colleague from South Korea, in a way, uh, said it, perhaps not as explicitly as I'm saying to you. I, would, I, I think uh, non-Western democratic societies have an interest in the West. They would not like to see the West weaken. Uh, you know, for them uh, today, the West would be less dominant, but still an uh, integral, indispensable part of a global multipolar society. And for that, I think you need, uh, you know, uh, shall I say, uh, much uh, more conversations, more working arrangements. Uh, when it comes today to challenges like maritime security, counterterrorism, there, you know, the whole lot of global commons management issues. Uh, I, I do think that the West would be better served finding partners uh, beyond the West. And I think beyond the West is open to that. 